Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to episode 29 of Cognitive. And welcome back, those of you who are repeat Cognitive fans. It's a beautiful Monday afternoon as I record this. It is May 24th at 4.38 p.m. I feel like I was just doing this because I was just doing this. I recorded the previous episode this past Thursday. Surprisingly, I still have things to say. Those of you who've been listening for a long time, you will know, seriously, when do I not have things to say? (laughs) It's been eventful, though. It's been a fun and eventful week. Okay, at this point, you should know, (laughs) if you don't already, that I welcome your comments, and you can leave them on cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com, or you can put them on our group on Ravelry where I post all the show notes in both these places. Let's see what else, what else. I'm just going to buzz on through. By now you know my top notes. I don't know if I'm going to keep saying them over and over again. Let's go down to the warm thanks department. Warm thanks to tiny, shiny things. The best way to say it, Sally, is, hey, somebody had to tell me about that chair creek. I'm glad it came from a friend. (laughs) To be honest, last week, I recorded episode 28, and I just hated it. I hated it, hated it, hated it, and I just deleted the whole thing. So I kept trying and just couldn't get a coherent episode. I kept ranting. I don't know. I was tired. I was feeling wound up. So finally on Thursday, when I didn't have a patient until 12 noon, I said, look, it's do or die. I've got to do this. So I recorded the whole thing, and I think, okay, I kind of like this. So I'm playing it back, and (laughs) in the background I hear re, re, re from my chair. (laughs) And you know what you do, in case you didn't know this, listeners, what you do at a moment like that is you go, they'll never notice it. And they always do. The listeners always do. So all in all sincerity, this isn't like car noise in the old days where I couldn't help it. Really, it is helpful to tell me things like that. So I catch it the next time around. But I had to laugh because I was so hoping everybody was just going to think that their own chairs were creaking, not my chair on the podcast. But wait, there's more. If you pay attention to the background, you will hear my kids screaming. This has become a family ritual over the last 29 episodes. If I record when my husband and son are around, I swear to you, my kid has to scream something in the background at least once. And my husband has to interrupt even though the door is closed and it is a cardinal rule When mom closes her door, we don't open it. She might be in a confidential discussion with a patient who has a right under federal HIPAA laws to privacy. Nevertheless, there's always a reason for my kid to scream and my husband to open the door. And in this, I'd like to think that I follow in the courageous pioneering tracks of my dear friend, Jasmine Nitmore, who every time she picks up a camera to do a live, some kid has a disaster. And you know, I'm joking because it's not, that's not true actually. It, it's only happened once or twice that I've seen, but it heartens me that I'm not the only one that has wild out of control family moments because you know, we're all normal. Nonetheless, I'm controlling myself as I sit in that very chair to not squeak it. I'm also trying not to rub the microphone because I keep doing that. And that's why you hear all these weird like squeakity squeakity noises also is me not thinking and rubbing the microphone. It is complicated. My husband gave me a beautiful freestanding, lovely microphone. And I have no idea where the thing is. I'm still using my little Olympus dictation recorder that I've been using a version of since 2008, you know? 
Yes, cognitive, proudly using the least successful technology since 2008. <laughs> All that is to say, though, thank you. I, I did need someone to point out, don't do that with the chair, because, you know, you don't want me to think I'm getting away with this stuff. Seriously, it'll be the world's most annoying background for the rest of this podcast if you don't tell me. So it really helps me. Okay, moving on. What's on my hooks and needles? You must be wondering by now. Well, I had a brain wave. I had a brain wave. I am booking through my roving. I know. That's not what's on my hooks and needles, is it? No, it's what's on my spinning wheel, isn't it? Yes. Still, I was booking through this giant 20-gallon container here in my study of all my roving stuff I want to spin. And it has been a blast. But I hit these big, big bats of very coarse fiber that Anne Elias Stashy Mama gave me years ago. I don't even remember what breed. I want to say thin, but it doesn't look like the right color to me. As I recall, twin set Jan has fins and they always look black and white. This stuff is a lovely medium brown, a, a kind of dark medium. Very handsome stuff. I spun it into yarn several years ago, I think now, and I really regretted it. I said, what am I going to do with this heavy rug yarn? I'm not using a Navajo loom or anything like that where I might weave it into a wall hanging. I'm not doing macrame, although nothing is impossible these days. So I found a lot more of it and I looked at it and I started to spin it. Then I said, what am I doing? Why am I doing the same thing wrong again? So I took the little bit I'd spun and I chain plied it, Navajo plied it. And I'm using that now to tie off my skeins of yarn as I prep them for washing after I spin them. So that's nice. I got some use for that. But I didn't have a lot of it, which makes me happy. At any rate, the reason I stopped was I said, what's wrong with me? Make rugs. And the easiest way to do that is you get big needles or a big crochet hook and you start making a rug. And this is so easy, so fast, and so fulfilling. If you get bats of big coarse yarn on sale someplace, I can't recommend this enough. Now, those of you in the Wayback Machine may realize right after I started working in the prison. So back in 2008, I actually did this before. I was given bats of this fiber that I was told was buffalo. It wasn't. I never believed it was. <laughs> I kept trying to believe. Is it a buffalo blend? I doubt it. It just feels like a cheap hard wool. Uh, I don't mean that in a bad way. What I should say, it, it feels like a coarse rug wool that probably would have been less expensive. And I suspect that the person who gave it to me, who knew nothing about this, had it unloaded on her because the person who gave it to her was trying to get rid of it and tried to pass it off as an exotic. There is nothing exotic about this stuff. At any rate, so I had it around for a while and decided to get it out of my stash. And I held it against two strands of Aran weight acrylic in a green camouflage. I hate camouflage like there is no tomorrow, let me tell you. However, I at the time wanted to get rid of both things. So I knitted them together thinking, oh, you know, I'll just make some kind of blanket throw thing. And I did, and it was soft and warm. And that Christmas, my husband gave me the chair I'm sitting in, which is this strange greeny brown, like olive green brown thing. I hate the color, but it's an insanely comfortable chair. So, you know, what can you say? I put the strange looking rug throw over the back of the strange looking chair and called it a match. And over time, I mellowed and said, why do I have a rug on the back of my chair? And so, my gosh, I can't think how long ago it was that I, I guess it was about the time we got Minerva, so about three years now, pulled the rug off the chair, said, it's a rug, what am I doing? And I put it in the bathroom because we had a shortage of rugs at the time. And then I said, well, actually, it's leaking water all over the floor. I put it in front of the shower. So I thought, well, duh, I just felt it. So I threw it in the laundry and, you know, heat and agitation, that's all it takes. So you wash it in hot, hot water, put some soap into it if you want, but you don't have to. 
and then you put it inside a pillowcase in the dryer. Why? Because it's roving. You're going to have little tiny hairs filling the lint filter of your dryer. And so I did that. And the acrylic, of course, kept it from shrinking too far, but it did felt up very nicely. And it has been lying in our bathroom ever since. Enter the kitten known as Minerva. She decided it was a great cat bed. And so every night she sleeps on this mat in the shower cubicle of our big bathroom because she loves it. So flash forward to May 2021. I'm looking at all this roving and I said, we could use a lot more rugs. And I feel a lot more confident now about making them. So I grabbed size 15 knitting needles because those were the largest I could find in my collection. Started knitting it. The fabric that I made came out a little too tight, not really bad, but I said, nah, I don't want to do this. So I stopped and I said, it will be a trivet. And I looked at it and I said, wait a minute, I've got this big other bat of this random hard white fiber. And I don't remember where I got it, but I remember that it's again in that ubiquitous catch-all category rug yarn, rug yarn roving rather. And I took it and I started crocheting it. Now, this was where we hit gold. My crochet hook is a P as in perfect. And I started crocheting just by working around the edges of the knitted square. If you look in the picture, it looks all curled up. Don't worry about that. Now you have to be careful when you crochet on a big scale like this to go around the corners. You're going to do some chain stitches in between the single crochets that I was using because you have to give it ease to go around the corners. But it's still going to come out looking a little ripply. Don't worry about it. Just do your best with it. But remember to be generous with those chain stitches. And then what you don't see in the pictures was I threw it in the washing machine last night on hot and just put in a little bit of water and hot and uh, did I mention hot? and made sure it went through all the spin rinse cycles because I wanted it really to agitate. And then this morning I took it out, put it in the pillowcase and put it in the dryer. It came out so well. And the thing was, I took it out of the dryer just a little damp. I mean, barely noticeable damp. And I hand blocked it. I just heaved it and pulled it in all directions. And then I laid it down flat on the bathroom floor and it looks terrific. So I put it in our bathroom right next to our big bathtub and it's in its natural environment and it looks like it was made to go there. In the meantime, the picture I did include in the show notes is, remember Minerva having a thing for the first one I made? She went out and found it in the living room where I was laying it out to show the boys. And she simply, in front of all of us, just walked into the middle of it, sat down, made herself comfortable and fell asleep. And the picture is hilarious. She looks like she's riding this kind of white wool saucer in the picture because the ends are curled up and everything. But she loves it. So, you know, this leads me on to my work in progress. Now I have one finished wool rug, brown with a white border. And, of course, I still have a lot of that brown fiber left. So I went big time on this one. I just used a crochet hook because the P hook fit better than the size 15 knitting needles. If I were using knitting needles, I'd have to go up to like a 20 to get probably a fabric that I like, but the P hook worked great. So this time I just picked up the remainder of that first big bat and started crocheting. I'm using a, oh gosh, how many, I don't even know how many stitches wide. I just kept going till I liked how wide it was because the Shrinkage when you full it is not as much as you would expect. It's not very much at all. So this time I just went as wide as I wanted and it's very wide. It's about three times the width of my lap, I think. And then I got onto the rows and decided because these were big thick stitches, I've been crocheting this one and I'm calling it roving rug number two. Actually, it's number three, but I'm not counting that original rug from several years ago. And roving rug number two, it's a P hook and then the pattern is chain probably about 40 and then in the turn I think I chained when I turned I chained three and then I turned and I am going single crochet chain one and when you get to the end of the row you chain three and you turn and you go 
single crochet chain one and you're you're doing your single stitches into the chains of the previous row that's all I'm doing so this is a big rectangle so I won't be turning any corners so I'm not worried about the tension on this I'm more worried about keeping the rows more or less even which is a little hard to see when you're working this big believe it or not so I'm loving that and as I sit here it's at my feet and Minerva is stretched out on the first four rows of it looking blissful she loves these wool roving rugs but if you have coarse roving and you want to use it, don't waste your time spinning it. Make rugs out of it. This is outrageously nice. These are coming out wonderful. I know from years of experience with the original version that's blended with the acrylic, they feel fantastic on your feet when you get out of a shower. They do slide on tile. You want to put some kind of backing on the floor between the rug and the floor because these things will slide a little bit but not as much as you'd think, and we just love them. My husband, who was really grouchy about the first one, he thought it was ugly, because it kind of is, and when I folded it for the first time or felted it in the washing machine, he was like, nah, you know, nah, nah. turns out he's a big fan. <laughs> when I started making the second one, he was like, wow, that's a great idea, and it is prettier than the first one. I am not blending anything, including cheap acrylic yarn with it. My cheap acrylic yarn now becomes bears from other bear. However, I have a thing that I will not use camouflage yarn in a bear from other bear because I just feel twisted sending an image of clothing used in war to countries that might have experienced war or might experience paramilitary presence or military presence too often. I'm kind of hung up on that. I think you're going to traumatize kids if you give them a bear dressed in camo. Let me put it bluntly. So the reality is I don't do that anymore, but I don't have any of that left. Somebody gave me the camel yarn as a gift. I would never buy the stuff. I hate it that much. And uh, there, there's a long political reason for that that you don't need to hear. It dates from my antipathy to the beginning of the war in Afghanistan. And I have never forgiven the first President Bush for that. But never mind. I'm not going to quote Henry the Fourth Part One, where, or sorry, Henry the Fourth Part Two, where the dying king tells his son. If you can't handle the politics at home and everybody's going crazy, why don't you busy giddy minds with foreign wars? So that'll distract them all and they won't attack your throne. Okay, I'm not going to quote all that. Anyway, so, you know, I didn't quote it, right? We're all good. Anyway, you can see pictures of Minerva lying on roving rug number one, which looks like she's lying on a rug saucer. And then you can see her lying on the beginnings of the roving rug number two, along with the roving itself. Now, I am still eyeing the Owl Post sweater or another Agnes, but I just can't seem to get going. I have to really do some work on my UFOs. I feel ashamed that I still haven't sent my sister her sweater, the bottom of her sweater to try on. I'm not really sure why. There's some kind of mental block there that I'll sit down and do it. But I gave her a Project Repat gift card for Christmas. And what was nice was she said, okay, I've got all my shirts cut and I'm ready to send them. And I went online and footed the bill to send them because you can. I just gave her address and they're sending the, well, they sent the label to me via email and, but they printed her address on it. So I paid for it and I sent her the packing slip and the address label that she can just put on the package and send it. So that felt really good. So I'm giving her the the queen size quilt from Project Repat because it was on sale for 50% off last Christmas. She's fully aware of the discount. She's really happy. I'm really happy. And she's using up 24, 21 t-shirts on it. So those things are good. And I'll talk about Project Repat another time. I know I've talked about it previously on the old podcast, but maybe even on this one or maybe even on my videos. Anyway, so I'll talk about it another time. That's what I'm going to say. Meanwhile, you are saying, but what are you currently wearing? Well, I realized I have spring sweaters that I knit in 2020. I have two of them, the My Boy Lollipop pair of sweaters, and I love them. And I'm not one to wear a sweater in the spring, but I've decided these are good from about 60 to 75 degrees. So you can see a picture of me wearing the My Boy Lollipop. The yarn is Miss Babs DK in one of her limited edition colors, and I can't even remember the name of it, but doesn't matter because she's not making it anymore. Here's the interesting thing about that, and I, if I had courage, I would post two pictures side by side. I used the exact same yarn to make 
a worsted weight boxy, which is a mistake because it's really more of a DK. It's like a heavy DK. And it's so weird. It really tells you about yarn choices. In the boxy, this yarn doesn't look especially good in that big rectangular box shape. It would have been nicer if I'd made my boxy a little longer. I stuck to the worsted weight instructions and should have realized it's a DK. I should go a bit longer. But it's a very good, very usable boxy, but it just doesn't look that great. If you do a boxy, you don't want heavy variegation. Strangely, in the My Boy Lollipop, it looks like the yarn was dyed specifically to be in this sweater, that the yarn looks so good in the My Boy Lollipop. So it's really just this interesting moment in thinking about yarn when you make your own sweaters, that something you love on the skein may not look great in one sweater, and may be sensational in the other. The, the yarn color, it's not striped exactly. It's kind of a messy stripe, but it comes out looking like really thin, irregular stripes of different colored greens and whites. And in the lollipop, that accentuates the curves of the lollipop and the curve of my natural shape. In the oversized boxy, it just looks like an abstract painting gone totally nuts. That the boxy size and shape kind of occludes my own physical shape. And so those curves and wild stripes and all that just don't look all that great. Whereas on a fitted sweater, they look terrific. So maybe the moral of that story is stripey, thin, irregular variegation looks better on a fitted sweater. I'm not sure, but it's food for thought. Dizzy Blondes, well, I'm still on the spinning binge and you can see what I'm doing. I'm not gonna go through too much of it. I found an old, old braid by B. Myself, who is no longer dying. And so I spun that. And I also, I was digging deep. That thing's got to be six or seven years old, that one. And then I found two slivers by Fleece Artists that were a gift from another podcaster in Canada. And I am not able to remember her name. But when she knew I got a wheel, she sent me all this wonderful fiber. So there were two slivers of silk merino and they are the same colorway and each of them is two ounces so I spun each of them onto a bobbin rather I spun one onto a bobbin and I'm finishing the second one even as we speak and then I spun that be myself paler blue green because I thought it would look good in a triple ply with the two fleece artists and the be myself braid was a bit smaller. It looks like it's like three ounces as opposed to the typical four. So I thought they might go together. And what else? What else? I found this random bag of funny looking fluff. And it starts with this black stringy stuff, followed by just a plain blue wool that looks a lot like the Be Myself wool, but isn't by her. And then this very weird silk strings type stuff with irregular blobs. So I just spun that and that's a single and I'm thinking about blending part of it against other yarn, the pink part. The blue and the weird black string I think I'm just going to chain ply and might use to tie off skeins or something around the house. I also found an insanely beautiful skein of Yak Merino. It was from the old abstract fibers before she sold out to the new abstract. So again, these are mostly irreproducible things that I am spinning, but I'm having a good time. And if you look at the top left, you can see a whole bunch of things from the Ghost of Stitches West past, where I bought these beautiful fibers that I'll be spinning. And I will let you know who they are as I go, because I'm going to be spinning them in the next few weeks, probably. The really exciting thing is I have seriously cleared out about half of a 20 gallon bin of spinnable fiber. It feels great because I want to reduce the space that my stash is taking up in my studio right now and I want to tidy the studio and so emptying this bin allows me to take some of the stuff that's scattered around the studio and just store it in the bin to start clearing out a little more leg room in here because right now I'm just sort of walled in by my cat on the floor and all my spinning and knitting gear and paperwork. It's kind of terrifying. So there we go. And Dizzy Blondes is just a blast. I'm, I'm doing about a bobbin a day. A strategy. Well, we've been talking about distress tolerance skills, and I've been talking about the more general guidelines and ideas behind distress tolerance 
as opposed to the acronyms I was teaching you before. So today I thought, let me give you some of the, the general guidelines for all these skills I've been teaching you. I should have said this before, but you know, hey, I do my best. I'm going through my various dialectical behavioral therapy materials here. So sometimes you get it when you get it, you know? Okay, so a few guidelines you want to keep in mind as I'm teaching you these skills. First is sort of obvious and sort of not obvious, and that is you need to practice these skills every day. That one of the big mistakes we see in therapy is I teach people the acronyms, and then they come to session, and they say, I had a problem. I said, well, which skills did you use? And they look blank, and they just say something general like, I just distracted myself. And I'll start playing identify that skill with them. I'll say, well, what did you do to distract yourself? Well, I went and took a bubble bath. Okay, so that is the S from accepts. You changed your sensory environment and that took your mind off your problem. Or they'll say, well, I realized I just can't handle all this at once and I got focused on one thing and I just went through one thing at a time and realized I got through the whole problem. Yes, that's the O from improve. One thing at a time. The reason this happens is people are hearing me. They're just sort of listening to me in the background, tell them these skills like, oh yeah, I could do that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But they don't usually write them down, keep track of them and turn to them when they are in distress and go, which skill could I use? But that is what you're supposed to do because everybody is using some of these skills instinctively, unless you're very, very mentally ill. And the problem is you get distressed because your pet skill doesn't work today. So let's say I'm focusing on one thing at a time, but in the background, my kid is screaming, my husband is upset, the house is on fire. And focusing on one skill ain't gonna work. I gotta go put the house out, I gotta calm the kid down, I gotta make sure he's safe, I gotta cool the husband off. Okay, no, one, the O of improve, the one thing at a time isn't gonna work. That might, it depends on how you look at it. But anyway, what I'm gonna say is, I would be using improve and I would probably, I would probably be doing one at a time on that one. I'd say first, the, I'd prioritize first the fire, then the screaming child, then the husband. At any rate, what you're supposed to do is say, well, actually what I would do is the E from improve. That's encourage yourself. I would say, okay, I got this. It sounds like cr screaming crazy but I got this, I'm gonna go handle that fire first. So once I encourage myself, then I might use my one thing at a time skill. The trick is, we all use some of these skills instinctively, but when that goes wrong, what do you do next? And the answer is you look at your list of skills. I do have patients who, I send them the notes of the acronyms and they print them out and hang them on the wall and they tell me about that. And those are the people who have the greatest success that, you have to practice the skills. Even if you're not in distress, you can practice the skills. So I'm not particularly upset, but I have a lot of housework. I might also say one thing at a time, or I might also say, you got this, come on, it's just a bathroom. We'll just do the toilet, give it five minutes, see what it, how I feel after five minutes, whatever. I got this, I can handle cleaning a bathroom. So I might use my skills all day long, even when I'm not especially upset. Or I might say, wow, well, I just cleaned the bathroom, hint. Is there a recurring theme here that Dr. Gemma hates cleaning bathrooms? Answer, yes. So, you know, I might say, okay, well, I cleaned the bathroom, I cleaned the bathroom. Unfortunately, now I gotta clean the kitchen. It's time for a refreshing sniff of my favorite essential oil, which is generally citrus or pineapple. What did I just do? I just did the S from accepts, a sensory change to give myself a brief V, vacation from improve acronym, you know, so, that's both S from accepts and V vacation from improve. So sometimes I'm using these things as rewards. I'm not always using them for distress. You really, really, really want to write down these skills or look them up online and print them out somewhere and use them as a reference, which by the way, is gonna come up later in this strategy. The next is you wanna diversify your skills. You wanna try all the skills and try them more than once because some days, as you can tell, I'm focused on the O of improve one thing at a time and the E of improve, encourage yourself and maybe the V, give yourself a mental vacation. Most days, I have to admit, I tend to use the A of accepts, just distract myself by doing a different activity, change my mental focus. 
And I tend, almost everybody tends to use the A of accepts. I have to tell you, I tend to use contribute. Well, I'm not really feeling good. I'll make iced coffee for the morning for my son and I, because we'll both feel better for having that tomorrow morning. I might bake keto cookies. I'll feel better if, if my son has some cookies. I'll at least feel like I'm useful. So again, you want to diversify your skills. You want to try different skills every day. You want to focus on the fact you're using these skills because some days one skill will click for you. Other days that won't work at all. So you just need to practice. The third thing I want to say is how about this one? Remember my patients who are printing out the skills and looking at them? Yes. There's a development on that called make your own organized distress tolerance plan and then use it. Now we teach this to kids all the time in therapy. We teach kids, what do you do if somebody is bullying you at school? We give them a distress tolerance plan. Get away from the bully. Don't answer back. Well, in this order, it would be don't answer back. Get away from the bully. Get adult help. Okay, that's a distress tolerance plan. You can move those steps around. If there's a bunch of people bullying you, you literally scream for help. If you're on a beach and some guy is harassing you, you scream for help loudly. I have no hesitation. I've got no shame. Dean, I've been a therapist for paraprofessional and professional for 30 years. I don't even worry anymore. If I have a problem, I scream. In fact, at one training, they had us practice screaming for help, which I still feel deeply grateful for. Okay, but you need it. All joking aside, in your normal life, you want an organized distress tolerance plan. Like, what do I do when I'm mad at my kid? There you go. And I might say, all right, I'm going to do the R from improve. I'm going to take a deep breath and relax. My kid is making me angry. First thing I'm going to do is get oxygen so I can think. Take a deep breath and relax. And then I'm going to focus on one thing at a time. Instead of getting mad or screaming at my kid, I'm going to focus on what does my kid need. Yeah, we're in improve again, aren't we? Yes, we are. Okay, and I might talk my kid through the skills. I might say, you need to take a deep breath. Let's see if we can relax. Let's do a belly breath. Let's see if we can focus on what you want right now. Because if they're crying and screaming, it's like, it's not really about that. And then again, what you're doing there is the E from accepts. You're helping your child to separate their emotion from their problem. Where, you know, your kid needs a cookie and they, this is a very young kid, and they start screaming. First thing is, you're not getting the cookie. First thing is, you need, let's calm down. And, you know, so again, we're going to handle your emotion first. And when you're calm, you can ask me for what you want. And I may say, no, you can have a cookie, but you did such a good job that you're going to have a cookie after dinner. That'll be your reward. Something like that. Okay. So in the meantime, what I'm saying is you create an organized distress tolerance plan for when you have a crisis and then you try to follow it. And the plan is going to help you keep focused and keep on track because you're going to believe you got this. Okay. Now this isn't hard to do. What I'm really saying is why don't you take an index card and write your coping behaviors on it and carry it with you. And another solution, write a list of your support people that you can reach out when you're upset. One of the best solutions, and this goes under A for activity, is reach out to another human for support. So I always tell people who are depressed, you should have a card or a list on your phone of the people you call when you're upset. And when you're upset, you open your phone and go to the list and start calling. There you go. That's an organized distress tolerance plan. What's another distress tolerance plan? Well, I know when I have a tough client and I feel stressed afterwards, I may say, okay, it's time to do a different activity, the A from accepts, and I'm just going to go knit. Okay, or I may sit down and take a deep breath and say, I can relax the R from improve and calm myself down and breathe, and I can move my focus to my next patient. So at any rate, here are the three distress tolerance guidelines that I've just set. First one is practice your skills every day, even if you're not in distress. You want to keep practicing the skills because you want to be familiar with them. Also, by the way, they're kind of enjoyable, you know, so it's not a big problem. Second, you want to try every skill more than once to diversify your skills because you never know what's going to click for you in the moment of distress. Third, you want to create organized distress tolerance plans for crises, and then you have to keep committed to following it. Easy way to do it, write your favorite skills on an index card or in the notes program on your phone and carry it with you. When in doubt, look at the card. Another easy plan, jot down the names and phone numbers of everybody you call or text when you're distressed. Keep it with you. Put a lid on it. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. The only thing I can say about put a lid on it 
is I'm experimenting with the wide world of phone apps for food delivery from chain places, and I'm really enjoying it. That's all I got to say. We went to Blaze Pizza for lunch today, and we were getting the tires fixed on my husband's car. And so we're sitting at the Costco, and they said to my husband, two hours, and he just said, oh, I'll sit here two hours. And I just looked at him and said, hey, it's 11.15, why don't we go get lunch? And then realized we were right down the road from Blaze, which is Keto Pizza, my favorite place these days. And so we whipped out my phone and put in the order so that they could start cooking it while we were extracting ourselves carefully and safely from Costco. So put a lid on it now. Haven't been cooking. Don't know if I should even mention the section at this point, unless I'm cooking. Ah, oh, shoot. I am sidelined. I have a minor gastric illness, which I'm not going to go into. <laughs> Irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, but I've had a few problems and have been having trouble sleeping and feeling just a little wrung out. So I'm waiting to get over that. Meanwhile, on the gear from the bottom up, I've pretty much done the clothing, which leads me down to the accessories. And really, when I'm talking about accessories, the first accessory is always fluid. You have to carry water if you go too far. There are other options. When I go on a long run, I'll take water bottles and I'll hide them in the bushes at intervals along the trail and pick them up as I go. But I haven't had to do that in a while. You have to carry fluids. You have to have a way to refresh yourself. Now, when I'm biking, I'm in that leisure category, so I'll bike by a Starbucks and make sure it's at a good place to stop, use a restroom, and drink something nice. But if I'm not doing all that, I like to carry water bottles, and I like to carry the ones that don't leach plastic, and really don't carry anything but water. Carrying booze is idiotic if you're exercising. It's just crazy. It's going to make you feel terrible afterwards. You'll dehydrate. And carrying iced tea, coffee, and all that, your body doesn't really want that. When you're working out, your body wants water, so stick to water. Then there's the funky waters that have vitamins and some type of sweetener. Don't do that. The sweeteners are going to make you thirstier. The vitamins don't add anything to it at that point. When you are exercising, you are dehydrating. When you are dehydrating, your body wants straight up water. Almost anything else is going to serve to dehydrate you. Gatorade, you say. Gatorade is full of a lot of unhealthy stuff. And the straight up Gatorade sugar, which is cheap energy. It's, it's not a very valuable energy. I mean, I'll use it in the middle of a long race, true. But I have to do sugar-free Gatorade because I'm diabetic. And it's really not that good for you. There are some Gatorade electrolyte replacement powders that are worth looking into. I haven't used them in a while because all the ones I found have sugar or they're using some artificial sweetener that's not really good for me. Again, you want to be careful with those things. You have to be pretty dehydrated to need electrolytes on that scale. My rule of thumb, when I was running marathons and half marathons, about every three miles I would consider a cup of Gatorade, but not much more. Your body wants water. I can't say it more than that. So you have to find a system for carrying your water. The two best systems I know of are the strap-on belt that holds water bottles in some configuration and the camelback. Now if you're biking there's one more which is a bracket on your bike for your water bottle if you're comfortable with that. Even when I bike I actually prefer to use a belt that I bought in a camping store that just holds two plain water bottles in the back and also has a little pouch for carrying extra things like food or gels or your car keys. And that's, I've had mine since probably about 1996, and it, it's a great thing to have. These little water belts are wonderful. They work great. One of my gripes, their water bottles are often not large enough. They try to make them aerodynamic, and that doesn't work for me. I have a big clunky belt in which I carry big clunky bottles, usually the white bottles from the Cognitive Fiber Retreats, to be honest, the branded bottles. So... That's one way. The other is the camelback, spelled exactly the way you might think, except no C. So it's camel, C-A-M-E-L, back, B as in boy, A-K, all one word. And the camelback has been around for years, and it's a wonderful system. They're very lightweight mesh backpacks, and they put a bladder in them for water, and they make them all different sizes, depending on what you need. The bike camelbacks are light and very aerodynamic, generally, 
The hiking ones are bigger and clunkier. You can carry more water, but you don't need to be aerodynamic. I like the Camelbacks a lot. I have one hidden in my closet even as we speak. I haven't been using them because I save the Camelback for the longer runs or the longer bike rides. On the short runs, I'm really happy with just my water belt on my bike. I have a bracket on the frame and I carry the water belt because I like a lot of water. So when you're looking at outfitting yourself for exercise, with the exception, I guess, of swimming, but even exercise inside a gym, you have to have a system for carrying the fluids. And you really, really want to get serious about that. I'll try to put some links, at least to Camelback, in the show notes, where I always put my links, so you can look at these things. For finding a water belt, that goes in and out of style. If you want good water belts, go to a running store. They tend to have them, and they tend to be more close to your hips, fitted aerodynamic, smaller bottles, like a lot of little two-ounce bottles. If you go to a general sporting goods store, like Big Five, they tend to have water belts that just have big honking padded pockets that you put a normal water bottle in. The other option, by the way, since we're all crocheters, right, you can take a nylon string and crochet a bag for your water bottle, just like a grocery bag type thing that goes over your shoulder. There are patterns for this on Ravelry. So you can make your own depending on how comfortable you are with something digging into the side of your neck or shoulder. I'm not that big on it. That's why I prefer it on my hips as a water belt. Okay, so that is carrying the fluids. Do I have anything else to add to that? Nope, I think we can move on to the fluffy books. Okay, I'm not even going to go into Zen and the Art of Writing. I started reading one of the essays today and got distracted. Last thing I knew, Ray Bradbury was in Ireland to work on a screenplay for Moby Dick with John Huston, and he hated Ireland, which I can't even understand. It turns out what he hated was the politics going on at the time, and this was probably in the 1960s. I forget when that Moby Dick came out. At any rate, no, Ray Bradbury did not have some insane thing against Ireland. I really don't want anybody who's Irish listening to hate Ray Bradbury. Moving on. I finished Something Rotten by Jasper Ford. And I need to move on to the next set of Thursday Next. He wrote these first books, and then he took a break, and then he went back to Thursday Next. And I need to go back to them. I don't remember liking the second bunch of Thursday Next as much as that first set of books. But, again, I can't recommend Jasper Ford and Thursday Next enough. I also finished What the Devil Knows in the Sebastian Sincere series by C.S. Harris. And it was fun. The ending worked out, as they always do. There were all the requisite scenes that you learn to love in these books. And the plot, I felt like it was a little draggy this time, but it began to pick up piece by piece. It's fairly intricate this time around, and I don't usually enjoy that in my fluff, but What the Devil Knows was a good read. Gets better towards the end. So you say, what am I reading now? Well, I am reading Another Time, Another Place by Jody Taylor, which is the latest in the Chronicles of St. Mary's series. Oh boy, the Chronicles of St. Mary's. If you love British history, and in general Western European history, but mostly British, you're going to love the Chronicles of St. Mary's. It is about a bunch of time-traveling historians who are paid to go around the timeline to see what really happened in certain key historical situations. Woven into this is the story of Max, one of the history professors, that's a woman, Dr. Maxwell, and I, I don't even know what to say. They are funny, they are poignant, there are entries in the series where Jody Taylor has clearly decided to break our hearts, and yet they are so funny, the characterization is hilarious, the craziness, the visiting of history, they're ju it's just a wonderful, wonderful series. I think Another Time, Another Place might be number 12 or something in it. You, you just, all the names of them are just hilarious cracks that use time puns. The other thing, Jody Taylor at Christmas writes short stories in all of her series, and she does this for St. Mary's every year. The short stories are epic, and they fill in a lot of the gaps between the novels 
that she sort of goes back and says, well, you're probably wondering how this happened. And then she tells you a short story about it. But every Christmas, it is a tradition at St. Mary's to do a special time travel jump to a sort of place everybody's always wanted to go. And those are just wonderful. They're just hilarious. By the way, in case you're wondering, St. Mary's has a rule that you're not allowed to check on certain things. Like you're not allowed to check on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ because to sort that one out would create political nightmares with unbelievable side effects. So it's a kind of nice idea that Jody Taylor as an author stays away from the powerful religious stuff because that would take the series in a direction she doesn't want it to go is just the nicest way. It would be kind of hard to manage as an author, I would think. So nothing too politically disruptive. They're funny, they're poignant, they're clever. They're very sweet. The first love scene between Max and her partner is one of the funniest things I've ever read, where I literally had to pull the car over. I was listening to it and I was laughing so hard I couldn't drive. And, uh, all I can tell you is go read the Chronicles of St. Mary's, but get ready because every emotion gets evoked. Something I really like. Oh, I went back to Blue Poppy on Etsy and I bought more toilet fizzies and more shower steamers. A word of warning, high shipping cost. The shipping and handling was almost half of the cost of what I bought. So you need to pay attention to that. One of the things I don't like about Etsy is a lot of Etsy people do that. Low cost goods, but then high cost shipping to compensate. I really don't like that. Having said that, I feel like I paid an equitable price all told for what I bought. What I bought. I had bought these before and I think I mentioned it. She has these little all natural toilet fizzies shaped like little daisies. You drop them in the toilet and they fizz and they clean the toilet. Now you clean the toilet. You take a brush after it's fizzed itself out and you brush around but it deodorizes your bathroom with a nice scent. I've been using lemon and it's just a really nice thing once a week to drop one of these in. I believe it's all natural ingredients. So I don't feel like I'm putting anything dangerous into our septic tank, but it really is just a way it freshens the, the toilet cubicle really nicely in my big bathroom. Just a really nice thing. And it reminds me now in my, both my bathrooms, I have toilet brushes in pretty containers sitting next to the toilet on the floor drop the fizzy in, you know, flush it, then drop the fizzy in, let it stop fizzing and, and scrub around with the brush. It takes all of three seconds, but it freshens up the toilet bowl. So I kind of like that. The shower steamers are just a personal indulgence. These are kind of like bath bombs, but she says don't use them as bath bombs because they have a higher concentration of essential oil than you would want in a bathtub against your skin intensively. You just put them in your shower out of the main stream of water, just so they're getting a little side wet on them. And when your shower is hot, the whole shower fills with the smell of, in this case, peach Zinfandel fizzy. These are too expensive to use every day. They're not very expensive. I mean, I don't think she's charging that much, like a buck of fizzy or something. But even so, it's a really nice treat when you've had a bad week, okay? Or when you're having a tough day or when you're getting ready for a tough day. So I bought a whole bunch of these toilet fizzies from Blue Poppy on Etsy and a whole bunch of the shower steamers. In fact, I bought out several flavors of the shower steamers and I bought out the last of the toilet fizzies. So good luck, but they'll be back, I'm sure. So I, I'm just really, really enjoying these things. On to the blather, you may say, surely it's time and it is. Well, we're on the countdown to June 3rd, which is when Junior gets his... Oh, creaked my chair. Oh no, I've been rocking. I'm sorry. I just realized that I was doing it unconsciously. Okay. I'm not going to re-record this. I promise you I'm going to keep working on solving that problem, that changing that behavior. Okay. On to the blather. We're on the countdown to June 3rd. So Junior gets his second shot. And then of course, 14 days later on the 17th, we're all free roaming feral people vaccinated and ready to go. We are still wearing our masks. We are aware of the fact that there are people who are too unhealthy to get vaccinated. I don't mean the stupid ones. I mean the people who legitimately, because of a medical condition, cannot get vaccinated. And there are also children under the age of 12 or children whose parents are buttheads, even though the kids themselves are eligible for vaccines. So from that perspective, 
we are trying to stay masked. And, you know, it just means like when I'm out running now, I feel much freer running without a mask. If I'm exercising, if I'm just walking around, walking from a restaurant to my car, and there's no one particularly close, I feel great being unmasked. But we do stay masked as much as we can in restaurants and indoor places. Meanwhile, my father, my late father, Vincent, turned 100 on the 21st of May. I remember thinking about it and thinking, wow, that's amazing. And finally making my peace with the fact he is deceased. He died at 61, which is really weird when I'm 60, let me tell you. He died of brain tumors and he died with me holding his hand, to put it mildly, without much emotion and much more detail. And I was thinking about it and thinking, you know, you don't make your peace with the idea your parent dies young. Until your parent turns 100 and you go, oh, wait a minute, he, okay, he would be gone by now, you know. I think Prince Philip, who was born around this date and was turning 100, I think he was born in June, made me realize that, that no, it, it's really okay that dad's gone because 100 year olds, not too many on the map. I had not thought much about it, just crossed my mind. And also my closest childhood friend has a birthday on the same day. She turned 60. But the funny thing was, the night before Dad's 100th birthday, I could not sleep. And by 4 in the morning, I realized I can't talk to patients like this. I'm really tired and exhausted and everything else. Strangely, I ended up taking the day off. I canceled at 4 a.m., texted everybody. I needed to text. And I'm lying in bed and thinking, okay, I woke up the next morning feeling pretty good after probably about three hours of sleep and realized that I celebrated Dad's 100th birthday by getting a day off. Humor me if I want to think that he had a hand in that. It's his idea of mischief. My father, well, let's say that Loki had nothing on my dad. He was very mischievous. So I like to think dad wanted to be remembered on his century and he insisted I take a day off as a holiday. Thanks, dad. I did a huge amount of spinning and just hung out and was relaxed. In the meantime, we are working our way down the list of big purchases and so we got the husband new tires today, and we all feel good about that. So we're moving right along. And the next thing up, of course, were the bath towels, which are in horrifying shape. And it's kind of my fault, but I'm not going to go into that. But I, I was washing them wrong, and I just abused them to death in the name of cleanliness. So I also went online and ordered really whopping numbers of luxury bath towels, which makes me very, very happy. So I just went online, and I ordered a huge amount of luxury bath towels for both bathrooms. I'm feeling very happy. They're not going to be delivered until mid-June, but it's just one of those things where I said, between all these responsible projects I've been spending the money on, it would be nice to refresh the towels. In the meantime, Eleanor. Eleanor, as you may remember, is wearing the cone of shame for two weeks, and she was being tested for lupus, and she has it. The vet called today. No big upset. She's pushing nine. Collies are prone to lupus. I kind of have known for a while that's probably what it is, but I wasn't willing to risk all our lives by going to the vet. And you can't do anything about it, really. There's not a lot to be done except keep her out of the sun. And she's happy with that. She doesn't want to be in the sun. She's lying in the shade preferentially. Her nose is kind of scaly because sunburn really over affects her. And so the vet said, yeah, her nose may be permanently damaged and lupus may make it worse. But basically, she said, keep her indoors. They're going to try her on steroids. I don't know. I've had mixed results when they've put my various dogs as they aged on steroids. We'll see how she tolerates it. But Elle is very happy and very comfortable. Now, this is Eleanor we're talking about, a.k.a. looks just like Lassie. Everywhere she goes, everybody wants to pet her because she is a mind-bendingly beautiful dog. And she loves people. Has no use for other dogs, although she seems to enjoy blankets. But otherwise, she has no use for other dogs. But imagine taking your dog to the vet and everybody is saying, Oh, look! And they all want to pet her. And then they go, She's so sweet! Well, of course she's sweet. She's had almost nine years of this reaction from humans. Humans just love her. And so she just loves humans. She knows we're all going to pet her. So she's wearing the cone of shame. Now this is a collie. They're not dumb by any stretch of the imagination. So she has learned to manipulate the cone of shame. This is hilarious. She uses it to open doors. 
She uses it to open the baby gate so she can get into the bathroom and steal the cat food and rummage in the cat litter box. Mm -hmm. She's able to get into the one crate we still have. You know, we used to have crates for all our four big dogs. Now we're down to two big dogs and we just use one crate because we thought only blankets liked the crate. Turns out they both like the crate, but only sometimes. So she likes to lie in the crate now. I think because nobody can really bug her with the cone on her head. So she goes in the crate and she has figured out how to maneuver around the crate carefully without getting stuck. I came in last night, found her eating some cat food that was suspiciously spilled on the floor by my son. Now she shouldn't be able to reach it because the cone is longer than she is from where the cone is connected to her neck to the tip of her long pointy snout. And yet there she was. She had propped the cone so that she could stretch her neck forward and grab the cat food off the floor. I don't know how she does it. At any rate, the pity party is over. Eleanor has gotten so much love in this cone and she expects it and she gets chicken every night with painkiller in it. Now we're out of the painkillers. That's okay. She expects the chicken. She now knows when I go to the fridge twice a day after her meal in the morning and the evening, she's supposed to get chicken. Blankets is frothing with frustration. Either way, I want you all to know, Eleanor looks very down in her picture, but she's not. She's just lying down there after a shot of her pain meds. I think she's just having a nap. She's at that age where she naps sometimes with her eyes open, which weirds us all out. But although she looks quite pitiable in the picture, Eleanor is having a great time. The cone of shame, she probably thinks of it as the best invention ever made because now she's getting chicken treats all the time. And then she gets these amazing painkillers too. But at this point, the vet said, no, she's not in pain. She should be fine. But we have to protect her nose until it heals. And the stitches come out on Monday, a week from today. So poor Elle, alas, another week in the cone of shame. But she doesn't seem to even care, to be honest. The only change in her life, we do not put water in the outside water trough because there is a chance she'll get herself stuck in it with her cone and she could drown. So I don't think that's likely, but I'm not taking the risk with my big girl. So Eleanor is doing just great, and the talk with the vet today went very, very well. So that's one of the big expenses almost over. Meanwhile, Minerva gets the last word. Minerva passed a landmark yesterday morning. She got her first mouse. This is a big one. Minerva was taken from her mother too young, and she plainly was never taught, as cats must be taught by an older cat, how to do a kill bite, which means Minerva chases things and then when the moment comes to pounce, she doesn't know what to do. Well, apparently she figured it out. I got up yesterday morning and there by the side of the bed was a dead mouse. Not especially fresh, but she had plainly killed it, not especially effectively, and I'm sorry, not especially mercifully, but she has been hovering around the cabinets that come off the floor in the big bathroom for several days, and I began to hear rustling. So she knew there was a mouse in there. Then she figured out how to open the cabinets, and then, well, yesterday morning, dead mouse. And we all did what every cat dreams of. We gathered around the mouse and celebrated Minerva. I picked her up, normally she hates that. I cuddled her in my arms. I rubbed my chin across her head, which she thinks of as my mother cat mode. And I scratched under her chin and said, oh, what a good girl. And we all did. My husband, my son, and I. And she purred, which is not something she does a lot of. And she certainly doesn't do it when I pick her up. But she was absolutely clear that we were doing mouse praise. So if you look, there is not a picture of the mouse. There is a picture of Minerva. She is lying on some fleece. I believe this is the random pink stringy fleece that I spun up that I was talking about earlier. She's lying there after her great success. After we all petted and praised her, she followed me around the house in case I wanted to do more of that all day long. So there she is lying on some spinnable fluff, basking in the sunlight of my reflected praise and enjoying the fact that she is now the mouse terminator. Okay, everybody, so there we go. That's another exciting week of cognitive. I'm sorry I creaked the chair. I'll try not to do it again next week. I'm really going to try not to do it. I just totally wasn't paying attention. But there we go. Everybody, please remember, if you're around people at risk, wear your mask. 
get your vaccine no matter what. Get your kids 12 and up vaccinated as quick as you can. Wash your hands, observe social distancing because you know it's all about we're all going to stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.